hi. Thank you for being here. Grand risings, grand restings, whatever time I might be catching you on. This is um, obviously a difficult video to do because as a spiritual coach, when you're speaking um, truth into trauma or when you're uh, not even speaking a fixed truth, just uh, ruminating and, and putting things forward to a traumatized person, then there are um, certain triggers that can be triggered off. And I fully expect that I'll trigger off some of those triggers in people. My heart is pure. I come from a state of being that I feel religion has divided the world deliberately and has not been doing it for as long as we are told. And through that, we have powers that be that feel separate from the people that they have power over uh, play us like a chess game. And I want to just bring some light into uh, the letter J. And obviously my name begins with the letter J. My mom never wanted to call me this. It was supposed to be Liberty. Um, but she, as a young parent, was told, no, we can't call her Liberty. So Guinevere, Jennifer, she, uh, she sort of settled on. It's always been interesting to me, the letter J and the fact that it's used so much uh, to this present day uh, in my granddad's day during World War II, uh, World War I, it's used so much, this script, this scripture um, to by powers that be to create endless war, endless famine, endless genocide, endless death, endless blood, endless rape, endless, endless torture. It, it, what good does it bring? And we have now uh, very much so we're seeing that and we're seeing the impact of the letter J and how strong it is and that a lot of people that are choosing sides are choosing sides on that on that basis uh, with scripture that is said that, you know, until Jesus can't come back until the, the state of Israel is a independent state um, that that and a scripture could go on a little bit more but of course that's edited the letter j did not exist in the hebrew language the letter i uh now seen with the letter j a lot um and that came in with germany uh, a lot uh coincidentally so i just want to take people through a little bit of a meander through thoughts. This is not a side picking a side. This is talking about powers that be manipulating and controlling us in order to make us feel triggered towards one side or triggered towards against another side uh, in order to create division, in order to create um, profitability. And in particular, the Middle East is a, a huge profit margin for the US and the UK government alike, as well as many others. Uh, as a as an oil oil keg, you know that that is available there in the land, the minerals that are available there in the land. So I want to just take people through what my thoughts and the way that that you know I want to try and summarize it as best I can. Uh, there is so much bloodthirst at the moment, and people talk about blood rituals, yet they, they don't recognize that being one of the biggest blood rituals are the wars that are created by these powers that be. And with blood rituals, people on the ground get this bloodthirst, this hunger uh, to cheer on more death, to um to, to okay more death, to, to give um, their acceptance to more death because some death has already occurred. It, it's the solution, it, it drives forward this bloodthirst and uh, it's one of the huge controlling factors that we've been under for a very long time, but not as long as they say, let's say. So why won't this mouse work? Let's just do it like this then. So I want to share the screen. I haven't done this for so long. Sorry. Um, it's not even there. It's in a big green button all on its own. So share the screen. Okay. So I want to read just some things uh, to keep my thoughts uh, concise. I will do other videos of where I'm just meandering through my own thoughts. But I want to mix my own thoughts with some of the things that I've found to try and draw in some kind of um, coherent video. Uh, so I'll put my glasses on. So we've got here, I need to clean the glasses first. Theo's been on them, bless him. 
um, to better understand the Palestinian bid for membership in the UN United Nations, it's important to understand the original 1947 UN action on Israel stroke Palestine. Right, the letters are getting smaller. Uh, <laughs> the common representation of Israel's birth is that the UN created Israel that the world was in favor of this move and that the US governmental establishment supported it. All these assumptions are demonstrably incorrect. In reality, while the UN General Assembly recommended the creation of the Jewish state in part of Palestine, the recommendation was non-binding and never implemented by the Security Council. Second, the General Assembly passed that recommendation only after Israel proponents threatened and bribed numerous countries in order to gain required two thirds of votes. Third, the US administration supported the recommendation out of domestic electoral considerations and took this position over strenuous objections of the State Department, the CIA and the Pentagon. The passage of the General Assembly recommendation sparked increased violence in the region. Over the following months, the armed wing of the pro-Israel movement, which had long been preparing for war, perpetrated a series of massacres and expulsions throughout Palestine, implementing a plan to clear the way for a majority Jewish state. It was this armed aggression and the ethnic cleansing of at least three quarters of a million indigenous Palestinians that created the Jewish state on land that had been given 95, that had been, sorry, 95% non-Jewish prior to Zionist immigration. And that after years of immigration, I just want to say here, and this is where we get into the, uh, manure of, of the divisions and the labels that we seek to hold on to that are usually given to us by the powers that be in an edited and distorted version. I just want to say here that I'm not calling all people who say, um, who, who identify as Jewish, as Jews, Zionists, not at all. I did a video a long time ago about them by hiding under the victim, uh, under the cape of victimhood. And this is what we see here. They create a label, they create a movement, um, they create um, a, an aggressive move towards that movement. They hijack it and then they hide under the victims that they create or that they have created prior. I just want to state that. Um, where was I? Massacres, expulsions throughout Palestine, implementing clear the way of Jewish state. It was this armed aggression that the ethnic cleansing of at least three quarters of a million indigenous Palestinians that created the Jewish state on land that had been 95%, I'm repeating myself, non-Jewish prior to Zionist immigration. And that even after years of immigration remained 70% non-Jewish. And despite the shallow patina of legality, its partisans extracted from the General Assembly, Israel was born over the opposition of American experts and of governments around the world who opposed it on both pragmatic and moral grounds. And you see the shift in time, um, the propaganda, the mainstream news, uh, which has a lot of Zionist uh, control over it. Um, you see here the 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 way that they've managed to make it so that people living in the US and the UK are totally indoctrinated to feel um, obliged to um, stand for this state of Israel, which wasn't empty land, it was occupied land. It was not up for grabs, so to speak. Um, the British had already had um, mandates over Palestine, wrongly, in my opinion, until 1947. And when it became an uh, opportunity, like a big sale of land that was never really for sale, the Palestinians never put it up for sale. All of a sudden, there was an opportunity seen by Zionists to, to take on this in the name of Americans. 
And now those a lot of Americans are indoctrinated and British citizens are indoctrinated to believe that the people, our ancestors, our, our not so distant ancestors would have probably stood against this and been saying, what are you doing? Just you can't just you can't just make up a state that is already a, a place, an occupied place, a home. So. And all of this, we're going to go back to where this all started, because I know people will be saying it's been thousands of years. I understand that, but it's been thousands of years. Has it really based on which scripture? The scripture that a lot of us have been calling out for a long time, the scripture that has been edited. And we'll go through that. But never mind. I digress. I digress. I'm going to digress a lot. Uh, you've got to cover your back right now because they've also made these um, things legal. You know, they've made things uh, legal. You know, there is there is potentials for law enforcement to come down on you when your heart is pure, have no intentions of stating any peoples of any land deserve to be used in this way, abused in this way, and uh, traumatized generationally this way. Uh, so let's go on. I mean, this mask is much I need to keep highlighting where I stop. Um, patina, legality, partisans extracted. Okay. And despite the shallow patina of legality, if partisans ex extracted from gen the General Assembly, Israel was born over the opposition of Americans, experts, and of governments around the world who opposed it both on pragmatic and moral grounds. Sorry for repeating myself. I'll try not to go off kilter too much. Let us look at the specifics. Background of the UN partition recommendation. In 1947, the UN took up the question of Palestine, a territory that was then administered by, administered by the British. Again, wrongly. Approximately 50 years before them, a movement called political Zionism had begun in Europe. Funny enough, eh? Its intention was to create a Jewish state in Palestine through pushing out the Christian and Muslim inhabitants who made up over 95% of its population and replacing them with Jewish immigrants. Just because, you know, powers that be can decide upon that. They can't just do that, you know, based on some writings that cannot be cooperated and we do know have been edited and misunderstood. As this colonial project grew through subsequent years, the indigenous Palestinians reacted with occasional bouts of violence. Zionists have anticipated this since people usually resist being expelled from their land. Hmm. In various written documents cited by numerous Palestinian and Israeli historians, they discussed their strategy. They would buy up the land until all previous inhabitants had emigrated or failing this, use violence to force them out. Why not? Seems to be a common theme. When the buyout effort was able to obtain only a few percent of the land, Zionists created a number of terrorist groups. Huh? Like in 9-11, maybe? To fight against both Palestinians and the British. Terrorist and future Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, I know I'm going to slaughter some of, this, some of these pronunciations, bear with me later bragged that Zionists had brought terrorism both to the Middle East and to the world at large. Finally, in 1947, so you see how that's been used now, we're constantly under this threat of terror, under the threat of terror by rules of law, we can be placed in lockdowns now. Look at how your governments have changed their laws on what can be prescribed as a terrorist act or a terrorist in themselves during the COVID period. While everyone was distracted, I spoke about this too. Look at how they tightened that legislation uh, in preparation for things such as this, in preparation for their prophecies coming true, just out of nowhere, out of some sort of spiritual you know, a uh, void that, that that brings the divine through, that calls for much blood to be, uh, to be uh, drenched in the sand. Uh, let's go on. So I'm not even going to apologize for going off tilter. This is me. Um, 
Finally, in 1947, the British announced that they would be ending their control of Palestine. So a little bit like Afghanistan, we see history repeating with these cycles. And this is why we've got to be able to have these untriggered discussions um, from a pure heart in that otherwise the cycle will repeat. Many Israeli people are calling out to this and Netanyahu and saying, you've said this over and over, that this time it'll be done, this time it'll be done. You know, a lot of Israeli people are in love with Palestinian people. A lot of Israeli people are friends with Palestinian people. Again, it's not about the people on the ground for the most part, apart from the few fanatics that are really clenched onto the religion that they've been fed. It's, it, it, it's the powers that be using religion to manifest their prophecies. So, um, that's violence, uh, okay. Which had been created through the League of Nations following World War I and turned quest the question of Palestine over to the United Nations. There you go, you have it, you've, you've fought enough of a fight, you know, there you are, it's yours. Even though it was never theirs to give, do you see what I'm saying? Um, so at this time, the Zionist immigration and buyout project had increased the Jewish population of Palestine up to a mere 30%. And the land ownership of from 1% to approximately a mere 6%. Since the founding principle of the UN was quote, self-determination of peoples, end quote, one would have expected the UN to support fair democratic elections in which inhabitants would create their own independent country. Instead, Zionists pushed for a general assembly resolution in which they would be given a disproportionate 55% of Palestine open brackets, while they rarely announced this publicly, their stated plan was to take later take the rest of Palestine, close brackets. US officials oppose part, partition plan. The US State Department opposed this partition plan strenuously considering Zionism, contrary to both fundamental American principles and US interests. Author Donald Neff reports that Loy Henderson, director of the State Department's Office of Near Eastern and African Affairs, wrote a memo to the Secretary of the State warning, quote, support by the government of the United States of a policy favoring the set it, setting up of a Jewish state, setting it up, because that's what you do, you just set it up, sorry, back to the quote, in Palestine, would be contrary to the wishes of a large majority of local inhabitants, <laughs> oh shit, Sherlock, with respect to their form of government. Furthermore, it would have strongly adverse effect upon American interests throughout the Near and Middle East, end quote. Henderson went on to emphasize, quote, at the present time, the United States has a moral prestige in the Near and Middle East, unequaled by that of any other great power. We would lose that prestige and would likely would and would be likely for many years to be considered as a betrayer of the high principles which we ourselves have enunciated during the period of the war. End quote. When Zionists began pushing for partition plan, for a partition plan through the UN, Henderson recommended strongly against support in that pro their proposal. He warned that such a partition would have to be implemented by force and emphasized that it was, quote, not based on any principle, end quote. He went on to write, quote, partition would guarantee that the Palestinian problem would be permanent and still more complicated in the future. Well, what a seer he was, whoever he was. What a seer he was, because he knew that this was this was a real, I feel, entrenchment of the, the endless militarized state of war by these powers that be, that have hijacked even uh, 
recent history. Henderson specifically pointed out, brackets, proposals for partition, close brackets, are indefinite contravention of vary, to various principles laid down in the open brackets, UN close brackets charter, as well as to principles on which American concepts of government are based. These proposals, for instance, ignore such principles of as self-determination and majority rule. They recognize the principle of a theocratic racial state and even go as far, go so far in several instances to discriminate on grounds of religion and race. And now, if you speak of this now, you can be have legislation put towards you uh, as 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 speaking as discrimination when you uh, but you have to just ignore the past discrimination that got us here and has us here in this endless war. Henderson, end quote. Henderson was far from alone in making his recommendations. He wrote that his views were not only those of the entire Near East Division, but were shared by, quote, nearly every member of the Foreign Service or the department who has worked to any appreciable extent on Near Eastern problems, end quote. Henderson wasn't exaggerating. Official after official and agency after agency opposed Zionism. In 1947, the CIAs reported that Zionist leadership was pursuing objectives that would endanger both Jews and, quote, the strategic interests of the Western powers in the Near and Middle East, end quote. Truman accedes to pro-Israel lobby. President Harry Truman, however, ignored this advice. Truman Show. Truman's political advisor, Clark Clifford, believed that the Jewish vote and contributions were essential to winning the upcoming presidential election and that supporting the partition plan would garner the support that support brackets Truman's opponent Dewey I think that's how you pronounce it took similar stands for similar reasons close brackets so again that's the start as well of the real entrenchment like we have in the UK of the, there really is no sides. They have people divided on sides, but these people, you know, to garner the votes will stand for the same things that mainstream media and corporations would be putting money into. Um, so Truman Secretary of State George Marshall, the renowned World War II general and author of Marshall of the Marshall Plan, was furious to see electoral considerations taking precedence over policies based on national interest. He condemned what he called a, quote, transparent dodge to win a few votes, end quote, which would cause, brackets, the, quote, great dignity of the office of president to be seriously diminished end quote. And it has been. Marshall wrote that the counsel offered by Clifford, quote, was based on domestic political considerations, while the problem which confronted us was international. I said bluntly that if, pres if the president were to follow Mr. Clifford's advice, and if the elections were at, and if in the elections I were to vote, I would vote against the president. Strong words, end quote. Henry F. Grady, who was being called, quote, America's top diplomatic soldier for a critical period of the Cold War, end quote, what a title, headed in 1946 commission, aimed, aimed at coming up with the solution for Palestine. Grady later wrote, about the Zionist lobby and its, and its damaging effect on the US national interests. Grady argued that without Zionist pressure, the US would not have, quote, the ill will with the Arab states, which are of a such strategic importance in our Cold War, end quote, with the Soviets, sorry, end quote. He also described the decisive power of the lobby, quote, I have had a good deal of experience with lobbies, 
But this group started where those of my experience had ended. I have, I have headed a number of government missions, but in no other have I ever experienced so much disloyalty, end quote. No, so continue quote, in the United States. Since there is no political force to counterbalance Zionism, its campaigns are apt to be decisive. So he's just, end quote, so he's describing what I've just described. It, it was a, a starting point of, of a, an illusion, a charade of two sides, the charade that they play in the UK in the Houses of Parliament. You can see they're playing up to a crowd. They're playing. They're playing a role. They're giving each other space and time by firing questions to say what they want to say as a response to condition the public and ultimately both being led by their big donors their big pressures their big threats uh, and so on and so forth former under secretary of state dean ash ashson Aixen, i think also opposed zionism Aixen's, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, Aixen's biographer writes that Aixen, I said, says his name more than any other, quote, worried that the West would play a high price, would pay a high price for Israel. Uh, and they, they do, don't they? Don't, 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 don't the UK and the US and the US donate how many billions a year for such a small space, for a stamp in the Middle East? You know, mm. End quote. Another author, John Mulhall, records Aixen's warning. Quote, to transform brackets Palestine into a Jewish state capable of receiving a million or more immigrants would vastly exacerbate the political problem and imperil not only America, but all Western interests in the Near East. End quote. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal also, also tried, unsuccessfully, to oppose the Zionists. He was outraged that Truman's Middle East policy was based on what he called, quote, squalid political purposes, end quote. They're talking about a real dirty business. They're talking about a huge major hijack of America. For me, that comes with, you know, the, the, in the wake of many of the most elite Nazi uh, uh, opponents, components, were um, soaked up by the UK and the US and various other places and put in places of such power to lead us here. We'll get onto the letter J soon with that. Forrestal represents the general Pentagon view that when he said that quote, no group in this country should be permitted to influence our policy to the point where it could endanger our national security, end quote. A report by the National Security Council warned that Palestine uh, turmoil was acutely endangering the security of the United, United States. A CIA report stressed the strategic importance of the Middle East and its oil resources. Similarly, George F. Keenan, I think you pronounce it, the State of Department's Director of Policy Planning, issued a top secret document on January 19th, 1947, that outlined the enormous damage done to the US by the partition plan, brackets, quote, report by the policy planning staff on, position, on the position United States with respect to Palestine, end quote, close brackets. Keenan cautioned that, quote, important U.S. oil concessions and air base rights could be lost through U.S. support for partition and warned that the USSR stood to gain by the partition plan. Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's nephew and a legendary intelligence agent was another who was deeply disturbed by events, noting, quote, the process by which Zionist Jews have been able to promote American support for the partition of Palestine dem demonstrates the vital need of a foreign policy based on national rather than partisan interests. Only when the national interests of the United States in their highest terms 
take percent precedence over all other considerations, can a logical far-seeing foreign policy be evolved? No American political leader has the right to compromise American interests to gain partisan votes. I wonder what Kermit Roosevelt would say today, looking at the depravity, at the illegality, at the immoral, immoral stance that our governments take, both in the UK and the US and in many other places, that it is par for the course now that huge donations can um, take precedence over the national interests of the people living under those powers. Uh, I wonder what he would speak into this void. This is why I'm doing this video, because uh, I am not fooled by this conditioning. Um, I really dislike um, my heart breaks at what is happening to innocent people on the grounds. Um, and it is driven by general generational trauma that for the most part is indoctrinated within us with certain actions being taken to make it true, uh, to make that trauma very real, very raw, very true. And so it continues. And so I hope I'm speaking as a voice of reason into this void of bloodthirst, um, such as Kermit Roosevelt did, obviously probably not as concise, probably not as deliberate and uh, precision, because he obviously would have known a lot more than me with the um, minutia of what's going on behind the scenes. But yeah, he went on, Kermit Roosevelt. Quote, the present course of world crisis will increasingly force upon Americans the realization that their national interests and those of the proposed Jewish state in Palestine are going to conflict. It is hoped that American Zionists and non-Zionists alike will come to grips with the realities of the problem, end quote. The head of the State Department's Division of Near Eastern Affairs, Gordon P. Merriam, warned against the partition plan on moral grounds, quote, US support for partition of Palestine as a solution to the problem can only can be justified only on the basis of Arab and Jewish consent. Otherwise, we should violate the principle of self-determination, which has been written into the Atlantic Charter, the Declaration of the United Nations and the United Nations Charter, a principle that is deeply embedded in our foreign policy. Even the United Nations determination in favor of partition would be in the absence of such consent. Assultification and violation of UN's own charter, end quote. Miriam added that without consent, quote, bloodshed and chaos would follow. These people are seers. They saw what was going on. They tried to speak into it. Is it spoken about now in history? Probably not, no, in schools, no. Yet these people are probably mentioned, edited. Because chaos, bloodshed and chaos is what is being caused by this. And it was deliberate and it was a continuation of World War II. But we'll go on to that soon. And that would be my take on it that we get into. An internal State Department memorandum accurately predicted how Israel would be born through armed aggression masked as defense. What are we seeing now? Who really, who really started this? I don't think it was Palestinian people on the ground, the children for the most part, very poor, malnourished. Let's go on. Quote, the Jews will be actual aggressors against the Arabs. However, the Jews will claim that they are merely defending the boundaries of a state which were traced by the UN. In the event of such Arab outside aid, the Jews will come running to the Secretary Council with the claim that their state 
is the object of armed aggression and will use every means to obscure the fact that it is their own armed aggression against the Arabs inside which the cause of Arab counterattack, end quote. And American Vice Counsel William J. Porter foresaw another outcome of this partition plan, that no Arab state would actually ever come to be in Palestine. Pro-Israel pressure on General Assembly members. And this is what we've seen during the COVID period. It's the same blueprint. It's the same script because it's worked for them. And they've got to continue it because as soon as they don't continue it, all of a sudden these truths will emerge. These truths will be seen and we will see that we have been played, played and much bloodshed, torture. It does not need to be like this here. And it hasn't been like this here for as long as they say. There was more connection to nature. There was more connection to the human resonance. There was more knowing of that without the distractions of people looking for profit through bloodshed. Let's go on. When it was clear that the partition recommendation did not have the required two thirds of the UN General Assembly to pass, Zionists pushed through a, a delay in the vote. They then used this period to pressure numerous nations into voting for the recommendation. A number of people later described this campaign. Robert Nathan, a Zionist who, Zionist who has had worked for the US government and who was particularly active in the Jewish agency wrote afterward, quote, we used any tools at hand, end quote such as telling delegations that the Zionists would use their influence to block economic aid to any countries that did not vote the right way. This is where voting is bullshit. This is where voting is bullshit because behind the scenes with these votes are pressures that, you know, it's that deal that Wayne and Trina spoke about. It's not really a deal. It's like, yeah, you're going to take this or you're going to suffer. So, and it takes a lot of strength to stand up to that. But people obviously were in the US and other places. People obviously were trying. Another Zionist proudly stated, quote, every clue was meticulously checked and pursued, not the smallest or remotest of nations, but was, contact, but was contacted and wooed. Nothing was left to chance, end quote. Financier and longtime presidential advisor Bernard Baruch told, told France it would lose US aid if it voted against partition. Top White House executive assistant David Niles organized pressure on Liberia. Rubber magnate Harvey Firestone pressured Libya. I don't know who that is. Latin American delegates were told that the Pan-American Highway Construction Project would be more likely if they voted yes. Delegates' wives received mink coats, quote, open brackets, the wife of the Cuban delegate returned hers. Go her. Not as cheap as a mink coat. Good for her. Costa Rica's president, Jose Figueres, reportedly received a blank checkbook. Haiti was promised economic aid if it would change its original vote opposing partition. Longtime Zionist Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, along with 10 senators and Truman domestic advisor Clark Clifford, threatened the Philippines, open brackets, seven bills were pending on the Philippines in Congress, close brackets. Before the vote on the plan, the Philippine delegate had given a passionate speech against partition, defending the inviolable primordial rights, quote, primordial rights of a people to determine their political future and to preserve their territorial integrity of their native land, end quote. He went on to say that he could not believe that a General Assembly would sanction a move that would place the world quote, back on the road to dangerous principles of racial exclusiveness and the archaic documents of theocratic governments, end quote. Wow, that is powerful. 
24 hours later, after intense Zionist pressure, the delegate voted in favor of partition. The U.S. delegation to the U.N. was so outraged when Truman insisted that they supported partition that the State Department director of U.N. affairs was sent to New York to prevent the delegates from resigning en masse. On November 29th, 1947, the partition resolution 181 passed. While this resolution is frequently cited, it was of limited brackets, if any, close brackets, legal impact. General Assembly resolutions, unlike Security Council resolutions, are not binding on member states. For this reason, the resolution requested that the Secretary Council take the necessary measures as provided for in the plan for its implementation, which the Security Council never did. Legally, the General Assembly resolution was a brackets recommendation close brackets and did not create any states. What did it do, however, was increase the fighting in Palestine within months brackets and before Israel dates the beginning of its founding war, close brackets. The Zionists had forced out 413, 794 people. Zionist military units had stealthily been preparing for war before the UN vote and had acquired massive weaponry, some of it through a widespread network of illicit gun running. Whoa, <laughs> go, go, go with, you know, the lights, bringing the darkness into light, you know, the, the, the children of light against darkness. It's all the other way around. And I'm talking about the political powers there. Illicit gun running operations in the US under a number of front groups. The UN eventually managed to create a temporary and very partial ceasefire. A Swedish UN mediator who had previously rescued thousands of Jews from the Nazis was dispatched to negotiate to end the violence. Israeli assassins killed him and Israel continued what it was to call its quote, War of Independence in a already occupied land. At the end of this war, through a large number military force than that of its adversaries and the ruthless implementation of plans to push out as many non-Jews as possible, racist much, Israel came into existence on 78% of Palestine. At least 33 massacres of Palestinian civilians were perpetrated, half of them before a single Arab army had entered the conflict. Hundreds of villages were depopulated and razed. A team of cartographers was sent out to give every town, village, river and hillcock a new Hebrew name, all vestiges of Palestinian inhabitation. Sounds a bit like the Christian uh, takeovers, doesn't it? And culture would be erased from history, an effort that almost succeeded. And this is where we don't talk about things in an untriggered way. This is where they can control the narrative and manifest the script. Israel, which claims to be the only democracy in the Middle East, <clears throat> decided not to declare official borders or to write a constitution, a situation which continues to this day, because it can't. It seems to me, through a lot of what I've read already, this was a, a coup d'etat. It was a pressure. It was a invasion. It, it wasn't legal. I think that's why that hasn't happened. In 1967, it took still more Palestinian and Syrian land, which it now illegally occupied, which is now illegally occupied territory. Since then, the annexation of land through military conquest is outlawed by modern international law. It has continued this campaign of growth through armed acquisition and illegal confiscation of land ever since. 
individual Israelis like Palestinians and all people are legally and morally entitled to an array of human rights. On the other hand, the state of Israel vaunted, quote, right to exist is based, quote, end quote, on an alleged, quote, right, end quote, derived from might, an outmoded concept that international legal con conventions do not recognize and in fact specifically prohibit. You see where you told one thing and and you you know it, it's um you told one thing and it is uh it's a complete other it's a complete other how do I move this screen how do I move it One second. How do I get there? Okay. Can I keep pressing? How do I move it? Sorry, people. I'm going to stop the share, find the one that I want, and um, go on one second. So I want to talk a little bit here about where I think this is coming from and, and where we didn't win World War II. It was all just a loss. And the people who um, predicated a lot of the abuse during World War II and massacre, you know, were absorbed into our political systems and have helped build our political systems since. So we are truly indoctrinated in the UK, for sure, to, to concentrate on the massacres and genocides of, of Jewish people, mainly in World War II. And we very rarely speak to the children about the amount of, of, of other peoples that were killed under that regime, under that war. So I want to just talk about that. And there's a reason for that, because they, 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 use, they use the Jewish title, they use the Jewish people, they continue to um, condition generational trauma in Jewish people. And they can only do that, let's say, also by ridiculously stupid people among other, you know, sectors of society that, that are only too willing to take that conditioning on and become highly prejudiced and racist towards people who are Jews. And so it's, I'm not saying, th th there's no sides here. What I'm saying is that these stupid people who walk among us take the 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 um, sugar from government uh, and use it with with to fuel their own hatred like a cancer within. Cancer can only feed off sugar. You know, it can only, it, 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 it can not only feed off sugar, but it feeds off sugar hugely. You know, that's what, that's what they give to people like that. So, but we are very definitely um, not taught to think about that it wasn't um, just against uh, Jewish people, that it's been very definitely, I think, from a major German standpoint at the time, uh, used as a tool, this letter J that did not exist in the times that they are now using the script to claim this land uh, a, as a focal point in order to hide under that cape of victimhood while using now the Israeli government to uh, and uh, as a proxy to 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 create such distress and abuse on other peoples of other lands. So I just want to talk a bit about um, this. By genocide, the murder of hostages, reprisal, raids, forced labour, euthanasia, starvation, exposure, medical experiments and terror bombing and the concentration and death camps, the Nazis murdered from 15 million and three to 31 
1,595,595 people, most likely 20,946,000 men, women, handicapped, aged, sick, prisoners of war, forced laborers, camp inmates, critics, homosexuals, Jews, Slavs, Serbs, Germans, Czechs, Italians, Poles, French, Ukrainians, and many others among them. One million were children under 18 years of age, and none of these monstrous figures even include civilian and military combat or war deaths. So why, you've got to ask yourself, when we're talking about, when we're trying to speak about an awakened state and uh, and, and people being able to come together, why, why is it that we can't speak about um, uh, this letter J, uh, the, the, the Jewish peoples, the Palestinian peoples, the Czechs, the Serbs, that were, but if we, if we, we, it's all concentrated on this one peoples and, and it's as if they've given them a gift while stabbing them in the back by making them the main characters to be used as pawns in this play that they keep playing out, this scripture. There is a range in this democide, genocide and mass murder and the most profit, probable figure subdivides the democide in various ways, sorts them and compares them, this democide to the war dead for Germany and Europe nations, the table was in the first list of various major genocides carried out by the Nazis and the numbers likely murdered. Uh, 16,315,000 victims overall. Then is shown 11,283,000 people the Nazis killed through institutional practices such as forced euthanasia, forced labor, and the possession of prisoners of war, or in Nazi institutions, particularly prisoner of war and the concentration death camps. Much of this institutionalized killing was pursuant to one Nazi democide program or another. And the totals therefore overlap with those for genocide. Finally, the list shows the occupied nations that suffered democide, clearly the Soviet Union and then Poland endured the most. But we're not speaking about that. We, we don't speak about, about that, you know, because that wouldn't work for them. Let's share the screen again. Sorry, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing the screen. This was supposed to be a great video. <laughs> so. So the letter J, let's talk about that, yeah? There's a reason it's always irked me. Uh, there's a reason it's always made me um, question the the non-ending war that that we're that we're constantly in and told we're wrong to speak on it unless it's the narrative. So let's look at this one. Why are Jews called Jews? The word Jew originates with the ancient Israelite kingdom of Judah. But what is the what what its name means is a matter of great controversy, yet you would be led to believe that it was definite, that literally you cannot, cannot question it, you cannot do that, you can't take that away. It could even mean thank God. So this article was originally published October 19th, 2015, it is being re-upped after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu discussed the topic at length during his press conference with the US President Donald Trump. So the word Jew ultimately comes from Judah, an ancient kingdom centered in Jerusalem. Lots of J's for, for a time that has been written about the, the letter J didn't exist, but let's go on. In the second century BCE, uh, and the reason people might say, well, Jenny, that's, that's not a problem, you know, languages have changed, but they use language. Language is a code, language is a frequency, which is why we divided languages up, you know, let them not be able to understand one another. 
um, that it's it, we create frequencies with certain letters. We create sound frequencies as they come out of our mouths and with the different accents, but they also have a, a numerical frequency behind them. There is a lot more to words. Words mean things. Words create uh, reality. Words, words do bring from spirit things into physical manifestation. So it is important. It is integral. And it's important who is now promoting it. And what with what I've just read uh, prior to the, to what I didn't share on the screen, you know, this has been created. It, it was a problem that was created in a stamp of a land that was occupied for the political gains of Zionists, for the political gains of of people who were taking over political uh, the political sphere, the governmental sphere, when they saw an opportunity after World War II. So. It ultimately comes from Judah, an ancient kingdom centered in Jerusalem in the second century BCE. But did the kingdom's Hebrew name Yehuda, Judah in English, pronounced Yehuda, beget Jew? And again, it's that English language that's really been the great divider and, and that that has enabled them to even edit and distort the scripture that they say they uh they rule from, they believe in, their moral standpoint comes from, blah, de, blah, de, blah. The earliest reference to the kingdom of Judah is in a clay tablet found in Nimrud, the capital of the mighty Assyrian Empire, brackets, and now a heap of ruins in northern Iraq after Isis obliterated the ancient city, close brackets. The tablet Kalhu Palace Summary Inscription 7, dating from approximately 733 BCE, describes the military exploits of King Tig Tiglath Pilsier, I think that I pronounce it the third of Assyria. On the list of kings and kingdoms he vanquished is, quote, Jeduahaz, Jehudaz the land of Judah, end quote. Clearly that refers to king, and I do apologize for my pronunciations. I'm just gonna wade my way through this with really messy feet. Um, clearly that refers to King Azaz's run with the Assyrians described in 2 Kings 16. Before we see how the name of the of an ancient kingdom called Yehuda morphed into an ethno-religious group called Jews, we should see the kingdom, how the kingdom got its name in the first its name in the first place. For the sake of good order, the original Israelite kingdom was called Judah. During a Persian period, during the Persian period, the land became a province of that empire called Yehud. Then in the Roman period, the land became a Roman province called Judah. But let's discuss the first of those successive entities lost in translation. According to the Bible, the kingdom was named after the tribe from which it arose. That tribe was Judah, which was in turn named for its eponymous progenitor, Judah, Jacob's fourth son. As in the case with his brothers, the, Bi in the, the Bible explains Judah's name is ba name based upon a on a pun, which is totally lost in translation. Quote, and she conceived again and bear a bear a son, bore a son, bear a son. And she said, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, Genesis 29, 35. The phrase in the King James Bible renders, quote, I will praise, end quote, is a D-A-H, which really means, quote, I will thank, end quote. If the name is a constant concatenation of Yehu, an abbreviate, abbreviated form of the divine name Uda, the verb, quote, thank, end quote, 
which would mean his name means thank God. I, I either butchered that or it's written really badly. Many modern biblical scholars reject the biblical account as mere fiction that developed over ages, mainly to explain the relationship between the tribes, especially when Judah should lord it over others. So if Judah, the ancestor, never existed, how did the tribe come to be called that name? The scholars do agree with the biblical Bible that the first half of the name is the abbreviated form of the divine name. Where they differ is on the second half. The American archaeologist William F. Albright hypothesized that ode is a verb meaning led from the root ydh, which exists in Arabic, a related language, though not in Hebrew. He sort of went around the bushes to get to that one, didn't he? Uh, thus, according to Albright, the tribe's name means led by Yahweh. The Jewish German philologist, I've gone, I've gone, idiot, kicked in. Julius Levy, on the other hand, thought that the name meant Yahweh's, quote, Yahweh's, brackets, people, arguing that the, quote, D in the name was the hurrying language, language's possessive case ending. Those, both these explanations seem unlikely. I'm glad, because both of those explanations and the writings of them seem confusing. However, Judah got its name, Magic. It didn't last long. In 586 BCE, the kingdom was overrun and destroyed by the Babylonian Empire, and the Israelite elites were exiled to Babylon. In 538 BCE, Cyrus the Great de decreed that the Israel Israelite ex exiles would could return to their land which was re restructured as a semi-autonomous Persian province named Yehud. God damn it. Okay, I'm back. For the next 700 years, Jerusalem, another J, and its environs maintained some version of this name as the land passed from ruler to ruler. That's better. This ended when Bar Kochba revolt, revolt was crushed in 135 CE. The Romans threw out the Jews and renamed the region Syria Palestine. But when the region was no longer designated by the Latin name IBDA, the ethno religious group that traced its origins to spread throughout the Roman Empire and received an appellation designating them as people from there. Idius, I think that I pronounce it, or Idius, this Latin word came from the equivalent Greek word Idios, <laughs> which in turn came from the Aramaic Yehudai, which in turn came from the Hebrew Yehudi, Judean. But what does this all have to do with the English word Jew? The Dark Ages descend. As the Roman Empire fell apart and Europe descended into the Dark Ages, the 4th and 5th centuries CE, the Latin spoken in the Roman province of Gaul slowly turned into what linguists call Old French. Latin words began with the letter I. A lot of the dates that you see on a lot of the Latin things that people think is a Jew, it's actually an I, uh, a, a Jew, a J. <laughs> it's a Freudian slip. Um, is it is is not a J? It's an I. But it morphs, began to be be pronounced like the letter J, which didn't exist at the time. Hmm, is that because it really wasn't beginning to happen? Is that because, you know, the letter J to create um, these, these places, to rename them, rebrand them, to create peoples from them, was 
the letter J within the script that is already edited and distorted, introduced deliberately? I think so. Later, during the following centuries, the name Idios became gradually truncated. By the 10th century, the French word for Jew was pronounced Judu. Judu. A century later, the word morphed into Jew. Meanwhile, in 1966, a group of French-speaking Norman aristocrats led by William the Conqueror seized control of England. The Normans not only brought French to England, but they also brought over Jews who made England their permanent home for the first time. Thank goodness, beautiful peoples. At least, the appreciable, at least in appreciable numbers, the new foreign people were known by their French name at the time, Jouy, Jouy? I think that's how you pronounce it. The Norman conquest, French tacked on an F to end, to the to end of their word, making it Jouf, Jouf, today. Jouf, some French people tell me how to pronounce that. The oldest English use of Jew on record, according to Oxford English Dictionary, uh, it says here, open brackets, which is the place you go. I, I would debate that since they've been editing that during COVID too, is roughly from 1275. Not that long ago. I know it's a long time ago, but in the grand scheme of things, not that long ago. Pilots him on Swarid Amrich Govin, I think. I'm just saying it for the sake of saying it because I don't think I'm saying it right. Question mark is a translation taken from the New Testament. Pilate answered, I am a Jew. John 18 35. Again, that J did not exist. And there is controversy, great controversy, even amongst biblical scholars who are, you know, ready to surrender themselves to, for the blood of Jesus. They're, they're, they argue about this. So how come we can't be allowed to say, hold on, where did this come from? And why do these, uh, you know, Jewish peoples on the ground, the same as Syrian people on the ground, the same as Palestinian people on the ground. Why, why are they getting victimized? But also why are they getting pushed in mainstream media? Uh, so they get victimized further by stupid racists and they get, um, but also they get victimized by their own generational persecution that keeps being continued by a government that seems to have been illegally made in a stamp of land illegally taken. So in the following century, several variations appear, Eve, you, you, and more. Eventually in the 17th century, that number 17, which has been perpetrated throughout COVID and, and has been a grift in many different ways, just like we described as the Zionists when I read the first part of this video, they were grifters moving through hijacking spaces that they had no right to be in, put in their own uh, prolifications and other uh, wants and, and requirements and needs above uh, national security, above national um, uh, uh, quality of life for the, the people of, of their own nations, because they are not of their own nations, they are borderless. These are the people that move in like cancers and, and attach to, to themselves to places of power in order to subjugate, condition and control and, and change a generation and change history in real time. How would you do that by changing letters, erasing letters, changing translations, having arguments over translations? Well, it, you know, it's ridiculous, but it works. So let's see. Um, eventually in the 17th century, the letter J appeared in the English language. It is a way to distinguish between I pronounced as we do, which comes from the Germanic sources, open brackets, example, island, close brackets, and those of French origin pronounced it like a soft G, so you, you. <laughs> 
fell into this latter category. It began to be spelled with a J. The first known instance of this spelling is in Richard Brainsley's Sheridan's Com Comedy of Manners, The Rivals, in 1775. She shall have a skin like a mummy and the beard of a Jew, quote. And that is how we've begun spelling it ever since. So you see where there's so much more to this in that like many things that are being uh, predicated on on in this realm today and have been for a long time are unnecessary. Uh, the people on the ground, the, the people who are still somewhat connected to themselves and connected to the environment around them, for the most part, are just bothered about that. They, they, they don't want to be um, paraded on the news as victims. They don't want to be paraded on the news as as um, perpetrators, it, it, it's governments uh, hiding in plain sight of other governments that are causing these conflicts and this pain to exist in this realm. So it's touted here uh, as, as such a great thing, uh, as such a hum humanitarian thing, as such a, a, a conscious thing, that 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 England had had province over Palestine uh, and gave it up in in the wake of um, Zionists seeing America as a way to to anchor in their stakehold in in some land that isn't theirs, and they used it already traumatized peoples. Uh, but they highlighted Jews. They could have chosen any. They could have chosen the Syrians. They could have chosen the Serbs. They could have chosen all of that. But they, they highlighted that. Why? Because this land been, is, is sandwiched in. It, it, it's, it's in the middle. It, it's, it's in the middle of a lot of different places. They, they needed a anchor point, a governmental anchor point there. And so that's where, that's what's been... That, this this state has been nothing but a problem. Um, it is fed money and is one of the biggest military powers ever. Yet we are led to believe that Hamas um, is is able to to do what it did without Israel knowing it was going to do what it was going to do. There was warnings from Egypt about that, um, and we've seen on the news that they are quoting huge. Uh, statements, huge headlines like 40 babies beheaded but then a lot of them are backtracking on that because thankfully a lot of uh, Israeli people who are being allowed on mainstream media, not so many Palestinian people are, um, are, are speaking out against it and saying where's your evidence for that because with that you, you are creating the momentum, you're creating the consent for the Israeli government backed by other governments to go in there in an already oppressed, suppressed group of, of for the most part, children, for the most part, under 13 is a huge percentage in Palestine, under 18 is the next huge percentage, under 30, well, forget about it, you know, the, the children, they use terrorists like this. Israel, the Israeli government has worked with Hamas before. The Israeli government, the Zionists we've just spoken about, made it so by doing these very things, by usurping, by threatening, by, by uh, taking away aid or threatening to do this or threatening to do that in order to get the vote. These votes weren't from an organic, healthy place of light and love. These, these votes... Uh, for, for this partition, for this stamp of land that has caused continuous trauma for many peoples, Jews included, it is, is, has been, um, uh, it, was, it was forced, it was not organic, it was not from a place of willing or wanting. For the most part, I feel, and I won't speak for them, but, but for some of my Jewish friends, their heritage has been in the UK for, for as long as matters. Uh, and and they you know they, they they were happy to be here, but now they really do walk around still, still 
because of that generational trauma and stupid racist that feed, get that governmental sugar and feed on it, you know, they, they, they now aren't comfortable here. So what did Given Israel do to do for Jews, really? What did it do for, because it hasn't done much for the Jews that live here, I can tell you that. It hasn't done much good for them um, where, where they are fully accepted, fully loved as as a integral part of of this country i can say that for sure the you know gates said having a huge number um of, of jews living there that isn't far away from me at all they are they because of the the state of israel and because of this endless conflict like netanyahu saying this time we will do it there are many israeli people calling out saying when this time just like the uk government says this time we will take out osama bin laden this time we will uh save us afghanistan this time we will uh this the, this time this time this time this time and so it continues for as long as we are unable to speak freely about the origins of where these things have sneaked in and how these things were created in the first place and how they hide under the cape of victimhood. It is one of their best assets in these endless wars that they have created. They learned to create victims then hide among them. Um, uh, it, 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 it's one of their best tactics. So when we look at Truman and when we look at, at the people that he uh, enrolled in in pressurizing, in helping to pressurize uh, the, the decision, it seems like that decision has real questions about the legality of it at all, even to this present day. And, and because of this decision, we are now in a place of peoples who've lived in what is called Israel now uh, for their whole lives, for, for, for uh, generations, uh, you know, having suffered so much and suffered so much even more so because on one side, the ignorance of all of the other peoples that the Nazis killed um, in great numbers, that's gaslight into them. You know, the, 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 the fact that it's, it's vastly ignored but also on the other side, it is gaslight into the Jewish community to continuously have to live with the ramifications of being victimized in the headlines, which then makes them real victims when walking on their own streets in the UK. So there's more to say on this. I think I'm going to leave it there before I get myself into too much trouble. But you people who followed me for a bit, you know, my heart you know I try uh, and this isn't me getting a dog in the fight I'm not gonna start you know debating with people in comments or you know because that's not that I stand with people I stand with the people who are being hurt um who are being traumatized um and and I stand against full-heartedly uh, the, the governments and powers that be that we've had in for too long, but not as long as they like to make us believe. It does not have to be this way. When these players are taken out of the equation, for the most part, people just want to live. People want to have an enjoyable life. Uh, people want to be connected and and honed in to their own space, to their own family, to their own environment. They they want to live freely, and uh, and it doesn't have to be this way. It's an, it's conditioned to be this way. It is manipulated to be this way. And I hope I've opened up some discussion. Again, I'm not saying I won't discuss. You know, I like a discussion, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna feed into any kind of. Um, racist comments or because that's just feeding into the energy and I hope my video hasn't done that but it probably will for some but oh but that hasn't start like fed into the insanity of all of this but it is we do need to look at that where did it start why did it start how did it come in why the letter j why 17 and the grift, 
the blueprint has not changed much. Um, this biblical script that they literally are building wars upon. Much love, much balance and much wholeness. Well, I appreciate you all. Thank you. Please share this. Or maybe don't. Actually, maybe keep it between us. Um, you know, liking it would really help. And uh, I hope to get on here. But I am building. I'm building in the background. So I'll let you know how all that's going real soon. Love, wholeness, and of course, balance in all areas of your life. Bye-bye.